we are Moon Rivas and Neil Harvison, and we, we grew up in Barcelona, so that we have this Catalan accent. So we'll talk about our stories. Basically, I was born completely colorblind, which is called achromatism. Uh, so when I was a child, I, I noticed that I had some kind of problem with color. I, I realized that other people in my classroom was able to identify colors, and I wasn't. So we went to the doctor, and the doctor said I had just normal color blindness. But then we realized that there was someone else colorblind in my, in my classroom, and I was really more colorblind than him. So I went back, and then the doctor said that I was just very, very colorblind. So then we just changed doctors, and we went to a neurologist, and then we realized that I was completely colorblind, which is a, a form of, called achromatism. So I see things in grayscale, and I've never seen blue or red or yellow. But I didn't know that until I was 11. So up until then, I thought I was confusing colors, and that I, I was only guessing uh, the colors and memorizing that the grass was green, that the, blue, the sky was blue, etc. So when I knew that I couldn't perceive color, I wanted to uh, sense color. I wanted to have a sense of color, not because I wanted to see the beauty of color, but because color is an extremely, extremely social element. It's, it's popular, and it's used every single day in elements that have nothing to do with beauty, but like Bluetooth, green peas, orange, red cross, yellow pages, uh, blue tag, yellow submarine, red bull, brown sugar, pink panther, the green card. Uh, James Brown is in his surname, so it's even his surname. And there's also a whole country called Greenland, so which is probably not even green. So uh, I realized that color it was everywhere in every single subject also when color is used as a code it's very annoying you know automatically which was the hot water and which was the cold water i need to test both taps also when it's used as a code in maps it can be confusing this is fine but if i go to tokyo i can get easily confused because uh, <laughs> some maps are just uh, coded with color also this this strange situation where three <laughs> yeah, so three different countries <laughs> share exactly the same flag. So uh, it's definitely a social element. Also, in descriptions, have you seen a man with ginger hair, blue eyes, and dressed in pink? If someone asked me that, I would have absolutely no idea, because the only information I get is the, ma the man has hair, that he has eyes, and that he's not naked. So that was uh, one other reason, because it's used in descriptions. So uh, at a point in my life, I wanted to avoid color and try to ignore its existence. So I decided to dedicate my life to music, because I thought that there would be no color in music. And I thought the piano is the black and white instrument. So I would focus on a black and white world, and the piano would, would be the keyboard, black and white. But then I realized that this wasn't uh, true, that there was been a lots of theories that relate music to color. And I, my teacher started to talk about the color of tones. And so color was also used in music. And uh, Newton, for example, uh, created this scale relating colors to sound. And then there were many more physicians and artists that thought that there was a, a relationship between color and sound. So I tried to focus on finding out more about this. And I realized that, yes, that actually, colors and sounds are both frequencies. Uh, color is a light frequency, and sound is an audio frequency. So I tried to find out if, if it would be ever possible for me to hear color instead of see. And then that's how I started the project in 2003 with Anne Montandon. And the project was to create something that would allow me to hear the colors that are in front of me. So we started this project. And the first prototype was the iBorg in 2004. And it was basically a webcam connected to a 5 kilo computer that I wore in a backpack with a software that was picking up the colors in front of me and slowing the frequencies down until I could hear them with a pair of headphones. And uh, I memorized the sound of each color. First, it was just six colors, red, orange, basic colors. And I, I started to memorize them, and then I was able to identify colors by hearing them. And um, that, that was wearable technology over, a, over 10 years ago. And I decided that this should be permanent, not something that I would wear. So I tried to design uh, something that would be implanted. So I thought it should be a body part. I didn't want to modify my eyesight. I didn't want, want to modify my hearing. I wanted to create a new sense and a new body part. So I thought uh, the new body part would be an antenna because it's something that many animals and insects have. And it would work in the way that I could perceive colors in front and behind, not only uh, what I have in front, but also move it around. Also, a new sense that wouldn't block my hearings would be bone conduction. So uh, trying to uh, integrate the sound through vibrations to the bone. So that was uh, the plan. Also, not only to perceive six colors, but to extend it 
So what, uh, what we did was to keep upgrading the software in a way it was upgrading my sense of colors, started with six colors, and by 2007 I was perceiving 360 different colors, one for each degree of the color wheel. And I think there's audio here. You can hear how I perceived color. Is no, that's right. Where the audio didn't work, we oh. plugged it in, so well, try it. we'll try it. It's, uh, whoop, that wasn't a color. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. I think it should be. So now I hear in different sine waves. So I hear color as a pure sine wave. We hear in between red and red and orange. So between red and orange is like a semitone, and there's 30 different microtones. So it's like very microtonal. microtonal. And it's basically, if we could hear the frequency of red, we would hear a note between F and F sharp, and then we would hear different frequencies if we went up. So it's picking up the light frequency, and those notes is the ones that I hear. So it's uh, like this. It goes on, up, 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 okay? And then, um, well, there was a point when I was able to perceive colors perfectly well, but I realized that there was saturation, and I couldn't perceive if the color was very bright or dull. So we added volume levels depending on saturation. So if a color is very bright pink, I will hear it very loud. And if it's dull, it, it will, I will hear it in a lower volume. Then uh, the body part was something that I kept trying to design. So I, I tried to design different things. First thing I did was to cut the headphones in half because I couldn't hear people. I was only hearing color at the very beginning. Also reducing the five kilo computer to a three kilo computer in 2005 and then into a, a one kilo computer uh, and then I was wearing it strapped in my body and it was still all with cables. Then I started to use uh, bone conduction by uh, pressuring sound to my bone, 2005, six. And then once uh, this, I found this worked, I tried to find a doctor that would implant the antenna. So this for a while I tried to hide the antenna so that people stopped talking to me because it was too much every day in my life. Since 2004, I had to talk to people because of the antenna, so I, I tried to hide it, but then I realized it was even worse because people thought I was doing something uh, illegal or something, that I was spying on them. So I realized that this should be uh, seen. I shouldn't hide it. Otherwise, it creates uncomfortable situations. So uh, in the end, I had it. Uh, yeah, this, uh, do I show here the implant or not? Is it here? Well, I had it implanted, and then basically, my skin was the reduced, first the hair, then the, the skin was reduced, then the skull was drilled four times so that I would have uh, audio entry directly into the skull, two antenna entries, and also Bluetooth connection so I could connect to the internet. So now I <laughs> basically, because uh, now I, I no longer need to just perceive the colors that I have in front of me, someone else can send colors from anywhere in the world. So. Now there's five people in the world that have connection to my head, basically, and then it's, it's one eye in each continent for me. So if there's, I have an eye in Australia. It's one person that has connection. So they, he, if he's now looking at a beautiful sunset, he can connect to my head, and then I'll be sensing a, sen a sunset. Or if someone in London is, an, is in the supermarket, he can just scan the different colors in the supermarket, and I'll be hearing them if he sends them. And when, when colors are sent to my head, this blocks, so I realize that something is being sent. And uh, it's uh, the next stage is also to connect it to satellites so that I can sense the colors in space, because there's more colors in space than here. So I want to perceive all the, the, the ranges of ultraviolet that are out there. So yeah, when I realized that I could sense all 360 colors, the visual colors, I, I didn't see why I should stop there. There's more colors than the visual ones. There's infrared and ultraviolet, so in 2009, I think well, I added um, infrared and ultraviolet, so now I can sense near infrared and near ultraviolet, which means that if there's any movement detectors in a room, I can sense them because I can hear the infrared. And in many shops, for example, I can detect if the alarm is on or off, and in many cases they're off. So it's interesting <laughs> to, to sense this. Also, ultraviolet allows me to know if it's a good day or a bad day to sunbathe, because if I hear ultraviolet, then it's, I know it can damage my skin. So there are two colors that are also behave a bit differently from the visual ones. And the intention is to keep extending these, uh, these uh, frequencies. Yeah, OK. I'm, I know Neil since I was eight year old. And I also shared this, well, I shared this perception of the wall with him. So I used to 
to be the one that uh, used to tell him the colors of the things and it was in our daily conversations. And then I, while well, we grew up together and I, will, I was also in Dartington when he started to, ex to extend his senses. And there was a point that I, I didn't have to tell him the colors of things anymore. And there was a point that he was actually better than me detecting color. And that made me realize that how, how we can how we can manipulate our senses and perceive our world differently. So I got a bit jealous and, and I wanted to manipulate my senses too in order to perceive the world differently. And I started doing, doing it with a kaleidoscope vision. I created a, a glasses that they, uh, would allow me just to perceive color in front of me. So I, I, wore, the, I wore those for some weeks and Neil and I would discuss like the color of things and how, how it, it would look. But, and then I, I realized that I was blocking actually a sense, which it didn't make sense. And, and yeah, and also when, when I was looking at uh, the color, I realized that every time the color changed, I, it was more about movement than the color itself, what mm, interested me. And as I'm a, I'm a choreographer, I, I wanted to perceive movement in the deepest way I can. So I thought that I have to, to experiment with what interests me, which is movement. So I, I decided to, to attach a sensor in my hand that vibrated every time there was movement in front of me. So I would point to, to, to the space and then it created a vibration in my hand. But then I wanted to be more concrete and I made um, the earrings. And then it would it, it have an infrared to each ear. So with my eye closed, I could, I could perceive movement in front of me. And then depending on the, of the interval of each vibration, I could, I could know the speed of the people walking in front of me. And if they were going from right to left or from left to right. But then um, with my eyes closed, uh, it, it was also, I mean, and then I realized when, with my eyes open, I could perceive movement. So I decided to turn them around. And this would create, and this create like, a, this opened my space to 360 degrees. So I had like, because I think the people had, have the, the back of the body a bit dead, you know, we don't have much senses behind our, our body. So I think if we turn them around, we can perceive things behind and then also in the dance scene, I think if all the dancers would have perception behind them, probably the dance pieces would look very different, wouldn't look so frontal. And also like people on the street, if they had like sensors behind, probably would we would avoid that uncomfortable situation when someone is blocking you and they, <clears throat> and they don't feel that you are behind them. Oh, for example, in a sports, probably people would also change the way we do sports if people had perception behind them. And then after experimenting with the speed and the space, I wanted to, well, I wonder if I could perceive something that goes a bit beyond my surroundings, that I could perceive something that it, could, it wouldn't depend on people or objects. So I imagine myself being alone in the planet and if, and if I still would feel movement if I was alone. And then I thought about earthquakes, that the earth keeps moving constantly, but we kind of ignore it. So, so then I thought, how, how would it be to feel the movement of the earth to a body? So then I started, my project is called the Seismic Sense, and it consists with a sensor that I wear attached to my arm it's connected to online seismographs. So every time there's an earthquake anywhere in the planet, <coughs> I get a, a vibration into my arm. And then I, sorry, <coughs> I apply this new sense to my dance pieces. And I have, I'm not sure if it's here. No, I have um, a, dance piece, a dance piece called Waiting for Earthquake, where the audience and I just wait for an earthquake to take place, which is quite often. And every time this happens, I move with intensity of the earthquake. So if it's like a strong earthquake, my, my movement will be stronger. If it's soft, earthquake will be more mild. So it's like a, a, a dance piece made by the earth 
and myself. So it's a like collaboration. So there's no, no earthquakes, then there's no dance, basically. Yeah. <laughs> this is, um, oh yeah, this. Yeah, this is a project we did together. When yeah. Moon was wearing the speed detectors, we traveled around Europe going to each capital. I was trying to detect the dominant color of each capital. So I was scanning the city and trying to detect what the colors were. And then I realized what the dominant colors were of each city. And Moon stood still in different points and tried to detect the dominant speed of, of different of, of the city. So yeah, because I realized depending where you are, the people tend to walk faster or slower. So there's like this common movement sense yeah. where depending on you are. So we wanted to define cities in a, in a different way. And, I want, and I'm creating the movement dictionary. So you, I can tell someone to move like a Budapest. road. Yeah, or Budapest. That's the speed of Budapest right yeah. now, the dominant speed. Whereas in Lisbon, they walk a bit slower. Yeah, for the, the slowest city was the Vatican City. <laughs> it's just a, a long queue there. And the fastest is London and Stockholm. So my life has changed in many ways, in, in daily life as well, not only ar artistically, but uh, the way I dress has changed, because before I used to dress in a way that it looked good, but now I dress in a way that it sounds good. So I pick up my clothes as musical notes. So this is E, this is G, and this is C. But if I want to wear a C major, I would wear this combination. So, And then uh, if I want to wear F minor, so that, that would be a minor chord, suitable for a funeral, for example. And then we are... <laughs> And now we are also designing uh, different sets of uh, clothes so that you can wear a song. So if you want to wear a specific song that you like a lot, then we tailor it, and then you have a specific suit that, that uh, plays the song. Uh, the last one was a wedding dress. So this bride wanted to wear the wedding march so she, so she, so she wouldn't have to pay musicians, and she wore this, uh, this wedding march on. And this is, for example, this tie, some tie that I wear. This is how it sounds. And here's where the tie ends, otherwise it would go on, so it would be a longer tie, but that's how, how it sounds. <laughs> Uh, also, the way I perceive food has changed because now I can actually compose music with food and food, food sounds. So it, uh, it, depending on how I display the food on a plate, I can eat a song as well. And also we created a sonochromatic menu so that you can go to a restaurant and ask for a specific song and then they serve it to you in the specific color. So you can have like uh, Imagine by John Lennon as a main dish or, or as, a first, as a starter and then some Mozart maybe as a main dish and some Lady Gaga dessert. So uh, then you have different songs. <laughs> and, uh, so definitely, if, if salad sounded like maybe Justin Bieber, then all Justin Bieber fans would eat that salad. So it, it, it would encourage some teenagers to eat vegetables in, in many ways. Also, the way I compose music has changed, because now I compose music by looking at things instead of playing an instrument. So I can just look at different objects, and then I can create music. And also, if I connect my head with a stethoscope to loudspeakers, then this music can be heard by an audience. So I can look at different objects, and then the stethoscope amplifies the sound that goes in my head. And that's how I create color concerts, or also uh, face concerts, by looking at the audience's face. And then if the concert sounds really bad, it's their fault, because the colors sound really bad. <laughs> also, the most exciting place to go is supermarkets, because that's where I hear more colors, like all these objects. Uh, I really enjoy just listening to products, basically, see how many of them sound. Milk is silent. So, <laughs> white things and black things are, so if there's no hue, there's silence. Uh, also, the way I perceive art has changed, not only in supermarkets, but uh, if I go to a museum, I can now listen to, oh, I can listen to artworks. So it's changed also the way I perceive um, artists, because artists have become composers. So I can listen to a Picasso and to, or an Andy Warhol. Sure, this is just a sonochromatic video where we mix the... So the, the sound of the film is based on the colors that appear. So this is the sound of the banana. And then you can hear the different objects that keep appearing. The grapes, bananas now, tomatoes. So the music keeps building up. The more colors that appear, the more music, so the more layers of sound. And 
now I'm here in New York creating a sonochromatic film based on, on New York. So we film in different settings where it sounds really good because of the colors and also the other way around. And it's very colorful because of the sound. So it's, uh, it goes both ways. Where well, the colors are seen. Yeah, just film where the colors will be seen. And the no, the colors will be seen. No, the colors heard. will be heard and the uh, sounds will be I seen, see. basically. <laughs> These are examples of uh, experiencing a museum. I can hear the scream now. It, it sounds uh, very uh, uh, like this. Uh, it clashes a lot because of the microtone. But each painter sounds very different. You can easily differentiate an artist from another. Like uh, Andy Warhol is very loud usually because uh, it's very saturated, so you can hear an Andy Warhol from very far away. Also, the way I perceive faces and beauty has changed because now uh, someone might look very beautiful but sound terrible because of the colors, or it might happen the other way around. Someone might not look very interesting but sound very good because of the color combination. So I like doing sound portraits where I get close to people's face and then I write down the, the sound of the skin, the lips, the, the hair, and the eyes, and then I send them an MP3 of their face, and that's the sound portrait. Uh, this is, for example, how these are green eyes. Here I added rhythm, so it's usually just a sine wave, but you can also create rhythms on top so you can create music from the colors of someone's face. So these green eyes and uh, brown hair. The third note is lips, and then uh, usually five notes. We usually have five different notes, and then uh, it's a unique chord, even twins sound different. So it's really hard to find two people that will sound exactly the same because it's so microtonal that it's difficult to find exactly the same combination. That's the color wheel, which I really uh, realized that there are no white skins and there are no uh, black skins. People that say they're black, they're actually very, very dark orange. And people that say they're white, they're actually very, very light uh, orange. So we actually all share the same hue. If I shut my eyes, I have no idea by hearing the skin if someone is very, very light or very, very dark because we share exactly the same hue, which is uh, orange. So I realized that humans are not black and white. We are all orange and we share different <laughs> lights. Also, the secondary effect of hearing colors that sound also becomes color. So if I hear, for example, a telephone line that sounds A, I feel green because it sounds green. So it feels like sound becomes color. Music, each note that I hear, I can relate to a color now. So I feel color when I listen to music. So I start to paint the sounds that I hear. So these are the first 300 notes of Mozart's Queen of the Night, from the first note in the middle to the last at the end. And that's how it looks like. And then this is uh, the first 300 notes of Justin Bieber's Baby Baby, which apparently uh, <laughs> that it looks very different from Mozart because he uses very different notes. And, also, you can transpose speeches, because when we speak, we speak in different frequencies, which relate to different colors. This is Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, transposed to color. And the other one is a speech by Hitler, which is uh, very colorful, because he used very different frequencies in very small amounts of time. And this is just a, a, a sock concert. I did a concert with uh, different socks, so I, I can use objects to create the concerts. Well, this is the waiting for earthquake piece that I already explained. That I dance whenever there's an earthquake. So we can. Well, the next stage in your is that you'll be able to feel where it's happening because now oh, yeah. you can only only feel the Richter scale, but uh, by the end of September, October, she'll be able to feel if the earthquake. Is... It's closer. If it's ca it's happening close where I am, or is it happening in the other side of the planet? So and when this is for... done. The aim is to, that this will be a bone implanted in the elbow. So it will be the earthquake bone. It's not, now it's an explant, but the aim is that it will be an implanted uh, bone. Now, yeah. Yeah, in 2010, Ian and I founded the Cyborg Foundations with basically three aims. One is to help other people to become a cyborg, uh, to promote cyborgism as an art, an art form and social movement. And then the other one is to defend the cyborg rights. Yeah, for us, so a cyborg is feeling that you are cybernetic. So cyborg means cybernetic organism. In my case, I don't feel that I'm using technology and I don't feel that I'm wearing technology. I feel that I am technology. And this feeling is what we call cyborg. Mm. It's feeling that 
cybernetics and your organism have united. The first union I had was between the software and the brain. In 2004, after five months of hearing color permanently, I felt there was no difference between the software and my brain. I started to dream in color. In my dreams, my brain was creating sine waves and was creating color. So uh, I felt that I couldn't feel the difference anymore between the software and the brain. And that's when I first felt cyborg, when I felt that there was no separation between the cybernetics and my organism. The second union was, was the body part, was feeling that the antenna is, is, is my body part. It's, it's not something that I, I wear or, or that, I, that I use. And this is also feeling, if someone touches the, the antenna, I feel this. I feel that someone's touching it. If it's there, I, I feel out of balance. Also, my official height has changed now because now I'm taller. Officially, I'm, I'm uh, seven <laughs> centimeters taller. So it is a uh, feeling uh, part of you, not, not something external. We find cyborgism is an art movement where artists will create their own senses and then they will express themselves through new senses that haven't been uh, used before. So it's a whole new uh, range of uh, art that can be done, like music that only people that can sense uh, ultrasounds can hear or art that only people that can sense infrared can, can see. So it's, it's uh, just, creating new art forms. Or art that just bees can see. Yeah, also yeah. Dogs, dogs could hear music or yeah, it's just not only for <laughs> humans, yeah. This is my yeah. brain, just a, it's a scan that was done to see how my brain had changed and that's, uh, my brain reacts uh, at the same, so if I hear something, both the visual and the audio cortex activates, so that's, uh, if I also see something, my audio activates. Even if it's a black and white image of an orange and I'm blocking my sensor, my brain creates F sharp because I'm so used to hearing F sharp when I look at an orange. Uh, and that's uh, how my brain has actually been modified. So organism and cybernetics have, have merged in an in, in invisible way. That's a problem I had in 2004. I wasn't allowed to to uh, renew my passport. I have a UK passport because my father is British and I, I wasn't allowed to renew it because there's a law that says that electronic equipment is not allowed on passport photos. So I told them that this was not an electronic equipment, that this was a part of my body. And then uh, I had to insist a lot because they didn't, they, they actually said no, no, no. And I, I insisted and in the end they said yes. So I was able to appear in 2004 with the first uh, electronic uh, eye that I used and now I, I still can, uh, actually this one's out of date and I'm, uh, I need to renew, I'm using a different passport and, uh, and hopefully uh, there won't be problems. And this is my passport, I renew it with my earrings when I used to detect the speech of the people. And I didn't, I didn't have that much trouble, I think they thought they were just like weird earrings, I said. <laughs> We also, with the Cyber Foundation, created different cybernetic extensions. The earwork does the same as this, but the other way around. So you have a microphone that transposes sound frequencies to light frequencies, so you can see sound. And if you go to a concert, then you can visualize the dominant colors of the concert, so it, it can work for people that want to experience the color of the sound, or people that are deaf and want to visualize sound in a way. So if you go to a concert, it detects the dominant frequency there, and directly to also with speech, if you're deaf, then you can detect what someone's speaking. I you have a dream. Reading the lips, but you can't really one day, the speech, whereas the color allows you to detect... Even the, the state of Mississippi, a state... Um, also, we've created electronic eyes with uh, for blind people so that they can detect not only color, but also distances or also words. So then you can read a book without having it to translate to Braille or also... Uh, We've done the, the electronic eyes to detect color for blind people that used to see color. So this has a different effect. If they, for example, they, uh, they're from Tibet and they had uh, a memory of color. So they could remember red, blue, or orange. So when they heard the sound and they learned the sound of color, they were actually visualizing and activating their memory. So they, this had a different effect on them. They, can, mm. they were visualizing the color that they had in front of them. This is the finger work. A, a boy came to the foundation with a finger missing and he didn't want a normal finger. He wanted something extra. So we asked him, well, what, what would you like to have? And then he wasn't very sure. So we asked him, do you smoke? Because maybe you could have a lighter, but no, he didn't smoke. And, it wouldn't be, <laughs> so. and now we asked, uh, maybe you could have something that would allow you to sense the exact weight of objects. But this wasn't really related to his uh, field. He was a filmmaker and also like to take pictures, so uh, we thought maybe a camera would allow you to sense things that you don't have. So now he currently has a camera, a little camera in his fingers, so he can 
take pictures of himself. So selfies are like this now. He doesn't need to take out his mobile phone. He uses his finger to take pictures. But the aim is, is that it needs to go further. It's not only, I think, cybernetics should, or technology should not, should not be only used to, as, a uh, tool. as a one way. It should go both ways. So we're trying that this camera will give him a kind of sense so that he can, so that he can feel something that he can't now. So it's still in the, in the basic level, this um, finger. This is the internal compass that we, we are creating, like a thing in your ankle that vibrates every time the, you face north, so you can orientate easily in the space. So there's already one woman that will have it implanted. She says she easily gets lost in cities, and she wants to have a sense of orientation for once, and so she, she will have it implanted down at the bottom of her leg. So. And this is something yeah. personal. It has nothing to do with <laughs> electronics or cybernetics, but I have a tooth missing, and I am, I'm going to replace it with a tooth that has a small light so that in case of emergency, I could just click and then open my mouth so I have light in case of emergency. <laughs> so it's a very simple um, uh, addition to, uh, to a body that doesn't really need much. It's just a small lab. But I'm trying to find a way that it won't go on and off when I eat. Otherwise, <laughs> it will be a bit <laughs> Yeah, so in, in the Cyber Foundation, we, we actually feel closer to animals and nature rather than, than machines, lots of people asking that. Because uh, if we compare ourselves to animals, our senses can be really limited. So we inspire uh, ourselves with other animals and with the senses they have. So, yes. yeah. So in my and case, for example, I, I don't feel closer to machines now that I, I am technology. I feel closer to nature and to other animal species, especially because I feel closer to insects that have antenna because I also have an antenna, so I feel related to them. Also, sensing through bone conduction makes me feel closer to dolphins that also can hear through bone conduction. And sensing ultraviolet and infrareds makes me feel closer to all those insects that can sense these colors. So I actually feel much closer to nature and to these animal species. Also, the other projects that we are doing, like having internal light is something natural. This fish that can also create light when they're in total darkness. Sensing whether north is something na natural for all other animal species that can feel uh, where the north is. And all the other senses are also uh, inspired with nature because we feel that uniting cybernetics with humans can actually bring us closer to nature and to other animal species in a way that we have never actually explored. Yeah, and our perception of the world can be different if we feel the planet in a different way. So for example, a lot of people, when think about earthquakes, they think that it's negative. But actually, the earthquake itself, it's not something bad. It's the, the way that humans haven't been able to adapt to the Earth. So that's why buildings are falling. Because I think if we all sense the Earth in a different way, we would behave differently. And so yeah, we encourage you to, um, to also explore the use of cybernetics as a part of you and as an extension of your senses and try to just explore it as, at least for a while, because I think now we can do it and we can uh, explore fields that have, haven't yet been explored, basically. Thank you. If you have Thank any you. questions. Please.